Good evening, everybody. Orient ourselves for the chanting. It's really nice just to, to invite the words to settle into the heart, not to make any demands of understanding even or um, getting anywhere but just to really invite the, the Buddha's teachings to be available to us, to be accessible to us. You know, there's so many ways to deepen into the, the truths of the Dhamma. And sometimes just the receiving, just the inviting the penetration into the heart can be a particular way of deepening into the teachings. So this mantra is quite simple. It's Budam, Budam, Budam one day, just as it says. Um, and so you'll pick it up lyrically uh, from me, I'm sure, once we get going. And we'll just do this a few rounds until we taper off. Buddha, 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 one day, Dhamma, 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 one day, Sangam, 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 one day, Buddham, Dhamam, Sangam, one day, Buddham, 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 one day, Dhamam, 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 one day. Sangam, 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 one day. Buddham, Dhamam, Sangam, one day. Buddha, 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 one day, Dhamma, 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 one day, Sangam, 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 one day, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangam, one day. And then perhaps we'll scroll up and chant the five subjects for frequent recollection. And just to orient you to the words, the little hash mark that goes like this, that means you go down a tone and the little hash mark that goes the other way, it means you go up a tone. So it's just a simple cadence with the down tone and the up tone on, the, on that uh, syllable. I am of the nature to age. I have not gone beyond aging. I am of the nature to sicken. I have not gone beyond sickness. I am of the nature to die. I have 
have not gone beyond dying. All that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise, will become separated from me. I am the owner of my comma, heir to my comma, born of my comma, related to my comma, abide supported by my comma. Whatever comma I shall do, for good or for ill, of that I will be the heir. Thus, we should frequently recollect. We'll just settle into our posture. Inviting the words to penetrate deeply. Remembering that when we decide to honor sensitivity, when we decide to practice, when we decide to care about intimacy with life, it's an act of going for refuge. Remembering that this heart has the potential to taste the deepest truths and feel that moving, feel those truths moving among us. This is one expression of the Buddha that knows Dhamma and awakens in the context of Sangha, of community. With the heart that's nimble and sensitive, having made an intentional move towards refuge, this heart then has the real, there's a real possibility of knowing knowing our own mortality, of understanding impermanence, of relating wisely to the conditionality of life.
to this understanding that we're always participating, always making intentional actions that leave a residue, and this is what we call kama. There's no way around that. And so as we practice tonight, we can simply continue to cultivate sensitivity, intimacy, connection with what's real, with what's felt, what's known, what's understood. Not pushing anything away. Not begging for a new moment, a wiser moment, a wiser experience. Just really honoring that what's moves, that what moves is nature. It's nature, it's here, and this is where we learn, right in the middle of this. This is where we care about intimacy with this. Everything belongs. Every mind state, every feeling, every psychological pattern, all of the world's unfinished business. Our physical challenges, the body's imperfections, everything belongs. The taste of this moment, the flavor might be, might even be wordless. 
might just be a global sense of something. It's not important that we describe. That we describe what we experience. It's just important that we're here to know it, to care, to feel it as a force of nature. To learn how to not take it personally. It might just simply be a felt sense in the body. An indescribable reality. Just know it, watch it move. No sense in holding too tightly. Just watch it move. And we'll continue in silence now.
And opening your eyes, coming back into the community with everyone. Thanks for your practice, everyone. Take a minute to stretch your legs. If you'd like, even step away from your computer for a minute or two. So oh, it's good to be together again. We are, we have been working our way through this great book, Listening to the Heart, Contemplative Journey to Engage Buddhism. Some of you might be following along. It's okay if you aren't. If you are, we're around, we're on chapter 13 now. I've been sort of flowing through the chapters without uh, a very deliberate cutoff. So we've been in the territory of 11 and 12 <laughs> for a while. And now we'll solidly move into 13 and head into 14 next week. So this is a chapter that's written by Tanisara. So Tanisara and Kitty Saro switch up writing the chapters. And they're such different Dharma voices. I just really appreciate them together. And I think these few chapters written by Tanisara, chapter 12 and 13 now are so beautiful and they really, um, they really highlight her, her integrative style of deep Dharma wisdom and, and embracing all that moves in our hearts, our psychological challenges and healing and what's moving in the collective structurally. She's really a, someone I look to for guidance in this integrative way. Right before the, right before I came on here with you all, I said to my partner, gosh, this chapter is so beautiful. I really just want to read it to them like a love, like a, like an act of love. Just, just read you the chapter. So I actually think I'm going to read a fair amount today just because I, I was really touched by it. But I'll, I'll share some of my own thoughts before that. But get ready for an extended bedtime story. I've read this quote before, but I'll read it again tonight. James Baldwin. He said, history as nearly no one seems to know is not merely something to be read and it does not refer merely or even principally to the past. 
On the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. It could scarcely be otherwise, since it is to our history that we owe our frames of reference, our identities and our aspirations. And to me, this is just a, yeah, it's like the word, like reading, reading the words of the Buddha. It's really a deep honoring of all the forces of nature that have informed this current moment. And, you know, he starts off right at the beginning by saying history as, as nearly no one seems to know. It's really quite challenging to at times really feel into all of the forces of history that have informed this moment. And not like we need to know what they all are, but to, to learn how to not take this moment so personally, a way of doing that is to understand that we are all living, breathing remnants of history. If it weren't for our ancestry, if it weren't for the conditions of the past, this moment would not be the way that it is. And so at the heart of the Buddhist teachings is this understanding of nature or of karma or of not self. It's this reality that we're all swimming in. That life, even though it feels so personal, so very specific to us, me, what's mine, what I make, what I do, It's just not that way. And this heart doesn't really know how to live into that. So it creates all these shortcuts, these moments of making, creating a self, making a self, becoming a self, because that's what makes sense intellectually, cognitively. But I think what Tanisara is pointing to in chapter three is that it is our responsibility when we, especially when we talk about belonging and talk about interconnection to really reckon with all of the forces that have informed this moment and to not somehow do this thing of separating out, well, this is relevant and this is not. Like the psychological wounds of our past at least in this lifetime, but perhaps longer are as relevant to our, this path of awakening as anything else. And what moves in the collective is a, you know, all of the forces of racism and homophobia and sexism and all the isms are all, up, you know, really reckoning with what moves in the collective in the most sincere way is can be supportive to our not just our skillful engagement our skillful participation but also how we transform and heal and realize nibbana and of course with the direct action last week up, up north i have had line three on my mind these days. And if you were around a couple of months ago for the Dharma Among Us that Patrice Kelsch and I were curating together, we had some really interesting conversations on Tuesday nights. And Nancy Bolio, I think that might be how you say her last name. Am I right about that, Patrice? Or did I get it wrong? Or can you say it for us if I did? I think that's right. I think that's okay. All right. She was with us um, one Tuesday evening, and something that she said really stuck with me that she said, We're all treaty people. She was speaking about line three, some and native rights, land rights, and she said, we're all treaty people. And what I 
took from her message is that we all have some responsibility in how we participate because we are alive as you know forces of of the past and all of past actions the way that our ancestors have engaged in treaty and treaties that have taken land from native people then you know it's us right now that have the opportunity to heal some of those wounds by participating by taking responsibility for for that legacy you know so just an example of how we might uh, how we might move with this understanding and even the title of this book listening to the heart connecting with the most sensitivity a contemplative journey to engaged buddhism the kind of this connection with the depth of our understanding with how we move about in the world and of, of course our experience is interconnected and this is what we learn through the buddhist teachings Engaged Buddhism is kind of a no brainer. It's like, there's no way outside of participating. When we really understand suffering and the end of suffering, we know that Buddhist practice is always engaged. What we're doing is waking up to that. And gratefully in some moments, our practice will even bend towards justice. But as we wake up to this force of history that is current, that we're also participating in and leaving seeds for future generations, we can see how, oh yeah, I'm always participating. I'm just waking up to that. So, I want to talk a little bit about dependent origination, a little bit about dependent origination. And this is a really essential map that the Buddha laid out as a way of helping us understand suffering and the end of suffering. So in the second noble truth, the Buddha reminds us that there is a cause of suffering. The first noble truth that suffering, suffering exists, that we can taste that, we can know, so we can understand suffering. And then the second noble truth, you know, the first noble truth, there is suffering, it's just this pragmatic statement. And in the second noble truth, there is a cause and that cause is craving. So dependent origination is a way of elaborating on the second noble truth, the truth of suffering, the truth of craving. This is a map of how suffering is created. And it's both subtle and detailed and also some really simple in its essence, which draws us really draws me in. There's this statement that could be, that the Buddha made that could be like a guiding mantra of our lives. And really, I, I feel like this in so many ways about some of the, the, the simplicity of some of the teachings that really, if we just relax, walk and talk and move with these teachings in mind, it's enough to awaken. It really is enough. And this is one of these statements. When there is this, that is. With the arising of this, that arises. When this is not, neither is that. With the cessation of this, that ceases. So it's a simple statement about cause and effect. And when we consider suffering and the end of suffering, we're very curious about cause and effect. What is the cause of suffering? How do I know that? And when we know that we can learn to disrupt or interrupt these cycles 
of suffering. And these cycles of suffering we might call samsara, which I've spoken to a little bit in the past. So dependent origination is a description of samsara. How suffering manifests. And suffering begins with this basic foundation of ignorance. So this is the kind of the basis of the map. It's a foundation of ignorance that gives rise to suffering. When we don't understand life completely, when we don't understand the Four Noble Truths, when we don't have a complete understanding of what this life is, you know, just as one expression of that, what I mentioned about nature and the impersonal nature of experience when we realize that we are all living in history and planting seeds for the for future generations, that none of this is personal, but you know, everything that you see is is really not mine, right? that this is one way of un deeply understanding the truth. And it's all these moments of misunderstanding and making something out of that, that really gives rise a really manifest suffering for us. And so all the activities that we make, all the things that we think and do all of the volitional activities, intentional things that we do with our lives and our minds, when they are conditioned by ignorance, they give rise to more moments of unsatisfactoriness, more confusion. And these cycles of samsara we can think about in two ways. In one way, we can think about in terms of rebirth. So samsaric cycles, ignorance, cycles of ignorance, foundation, foundational cycles of ignorance. When not interrupted, when not disruptive, give rise to suffering that keeps rolling on and keeps rolling on from one lifetime to the next. So for me, understanding rebirth and realizing like, oh, I have some inheritance. I have some potential inheritance from a previous life that I'm currently working through in this life, or even that generationally that collectively we're working through in this life, right? We have some inheritance. We are all treaty people. We're all reckoning with activities of the past in current time. That this supports not taking this life so personally. Oh, look at that. What I'm swimming in right now is an inheritance. Yeah. So when we think about, when we consider dependent and origination in terms of rebirth, we can we can see that, oh yeah, I'm perhaps undoing familial patterns of suffering. Perhaps I'm reckoning with family habits or psychological habits that are, you know, offered to me knowingly or unknowingly from my family or the environments that my family grew up in or, you know, whatever other experiences we might see in this way. And we might also think that, well, so I'll do as much work as I can in any of my unfinished work by the time I'm, this body is complete with his, it's thriving. Whenever I die, then I will pick up for this, 
consciousness will be reborn in another lifetime and continue its work, right? So this is one way that we might describe uh, the cycles of suffering in terms of rebirth. Another way that we might describe cycles of suffering are in terms of like these many moments that happen throughout our day. And we've had so many of them already where we've gotten caught in a, a kind of storm or um, a verse of loop or a greedy, you know, something that was constricting or we didn't feel great about how we lived or realize like, oh yeah, here I am neurotically going to the refrigerator because I'm bored, not connecting the dots here or, you know, what it's just very ordinary moments when we feel into the creation of suffering. So during the meditation, my mind got swept away by a thought of a family member who's struggling right now and it was really juicy. And although the mind was able to notice it very fairly quickly, it created its own momentum, right? And it took some effort, it took some connection, some remembering refuge to and to encourage that to settle, all that energy to settle. And you might notice this too, once we pick up a habit that is not that useful to us or beneficial or skillful even, that it becomes a bit more challenging not to set it, to, it becomes a bit more challenging to be able to set that down, right? And so these are ways of describing and understanding samsara that we can access right in the middle of our daily lives. It's a statement from Christina Feldman. And she says that uh, dependent origination is said to be at the heart of right view or right understanding. It's an understanding that is also the beginning of the Eightfold Path or an understanding that gives rise to a life of wisdom and freedom. The Buddha went on to say that when a noble disciple sees fully the arising and cessation of the world, they are said to be endowed with perfect view, perfect vision, to have attained the true Dhamma, to possess the knowledge and skill to have entered the stream of the Dhamma to be a noble disciple replete with purifying understanding, one who was at the very door of the deathless. So this, she says, so this is a challenge for us. <laughs> it's going to be a challenge for us. And so it's not only a way to experience our life, our, but also a way to experience what moves in the collective and for me to uh, find a way for steady engagement in disrupting cycles of suffering. So there are 12 links in this map, 12 links in the dependent origination map. And it's good to know right from the beginning, but that they're not necessarily linear, se sequential or even progressive. So, it's a, but it's a map that describes the confluence of conditions that come together in a particular way to manifest suffering. So it's like, you know, like cooking, for example. It's not necessarily linear that we, that the meal, that the good meal is because things happened in a particular order, but it's more important that all the right things were there, right? That we had a pan and the energy and the patience and the ingredients and the time, you know, and the being free of distraction to create the meal. So that's one way of thinking of this map that is not necessarily linear or progressive. And in fact, it can be interrupted at any point. It can be disrupted. These links can be disrupted so that it disrupts that pattern that's there, right? And so we might think of activism this way, a disruption of a pattern. 
this is why line three was, I mean, line three was on my mind for lots of reasons because of that, but it linked up right away to this chapter of study that we're on. Because that this action, this activism that includes reckoning with the past and planting seeds, beneficial seeds for future generations, you know, is really, is really a part of that disruption, the disruption that is possible to, yeah, disrupt the manifestation of suffering. So these 12 links that begin with ignorance and then volitional impulses is the next one. Sankaras. Consciousness. The arising then of body and mind, nama rupa. And then with body and mind as a condition, then there's the rising of the six sense doors. And with the arising of the six sense doors, then there's contact with the senses, the objects of the senses. With contact, there's feeling, feeling vedna or the feeling tone. And with this knowing of pleasant, unpleasant or neutral, which is feeling, then there's naturally a craving. There's a wanting or not wanting. And with craving, there's clinging. And when, when there's clinging, there's becoming, like becoming a person that wants that piece of chocolate. And when there's the becoming, there's a birth of a self right there in that moment. There's a Shelly who wants the chocolate. And then there's a death. So these 12 links. And interestingly, when, these, when this process is reversed, there's a, a process, it's a process of release or a process of freedom. So when ignorance is abandoned, for example, we find the cessation of mental suffering or mental formations. When there's a deep understanding, right? Then there's a release that, that uh, disallows the rest of the conditions to arise and, and, and create that pattern. So with a direct action, there's a, a disruption in that moment to a, even a collective pattern that's at the surface for us. So it's one way to think about all, for me, all of the activism that we do, all the ways that we participate in making our world better. Disrupting systems, even if there's not an immediate response, even if there's not a, an immediate reward, it's that disruption of the pattern that is really important. As much as it is, as it is important to disrupt the patterns, the psychological patterns, the patterns of suffering that are alive and well in our own heart. When we notice that moment of pleasant experience and there's a capacity to be with it, you know, perhaps it becomes quite difficult to get seduced, to be seduced by it. When I notice that this mind is really hating the experience of anxiety and there's a connection with that aversion uh, and a willingness to be with it, then there's a release right there in that moment that can be felt. It's such a beautiful thing, right? It may not mean that anxiety doesn't arise again. In fact, it's a big setup to expect that to happen, just like it's a setup to expect that with one protest, we will eradicate racism or transform the criminal justice system, right? It will take many moments over many years and perhaps even many lifetimes to disrupt some of these patterns that have been in existence or being uh, that have been cultivated and nurtured over a long time, it will take a long time to extinguish them. But we can be sure that there is a immediate 
and a beneficial impact, even if we don't see, even if we don't see the final, the final extinguishing, right? It's a way to think about our our well-being, you know, like if if the healing that comes from practice, I think about this all the time, like sweetie, so what if anxiety arises consistently from now until the day you die? For one, it's beneficial to keep practicing with it because there's there's a definite impact that I can know. And it pokes holes in that pattern so that you know this heart won't continue to relive in the exact same way over many lifetimes. Won't continue to seed the next moment in the next life. I think I want to read a little bit. Let's let Tanissa speak to us about that. She has such a good way of pulling these together. And so you can just sit back and enjoy the words, if you will. Chapter is called Through the Night Door. She says, the collective is always personal, and that is where we must start. As the Buddha encouraged, we begin with the body. In this fathom-long body, this perceptive form, I make known the world, its arising, its ceasing, and the path leading to its cessation. And she talks a bit about entering she was a, she practiced as a monastic for about 15 years. And she speaks really directly about the patriarch, patriarchal environment that it is. And so she's kind of making this comparison here. And she says that daily teachings encourage letting go of all self-identification, including gender. In spite of my spiritual ideal to live those teachings, my body knew otherwise. It carried the force of history. I developed a cough that wouldn't go away, no matter what I tried to do to cure it. Eventually, I realized that it was a symptom of having no voice. At the first development of mindfulness, the Buddha directs us to establish mindfulness of the body. If we understand mindfulness as a purely clinical observation of sensations, it can distance us from a meaningful relationship with the body's intelligence. If we just see the body as a bundle of pleasant and unpleasant sensations, which we dismiss, we overlook the information within feeling. Holding mindfulness or loving awareness to body sensation helps us receive the messages energetically held within the body. Deeply held beliefs that shape the whole matrix of the self can be accessed through their surface appearance as sensation and feeling tone. I'm just pointing to some of the links here. In this process, what is revealed beneath the presenting felt sense experience is the personal, the familial, ancestral, and collective history that is held within the body as cellular memory. It's just this beautiful integrated way of describing mindfulness of the body. Mindfulness of embodied experience enables a tapping into the energetic impressions of what has gone before. These manifest as feeling tones, states of mind, beliefs, moods, and an overall energetic patterning that constitutes the shaping of self. 
In the awakening process, a decrease in identification with the body can paradoxically deepen our experience of embodiment. Taking the body less personally lessens constriction around the body and increases sensitivity to it. So she, I wasn't, she says, I wasn't able to explore this therapeutically as a monastic, but I had the opportunity to do so after I disrobed. In one session in a very small therapy training group, I became aware of a tight sensation around my head. I had the sense of a tight cap being placed on my head. Connecting with the physical sensation revealed a felt sense, experience of fear. The felt sense is a term coined by Eugene Gendlin in relationship to his focusing work. It means having a global sense of something. The felt sense is composed of sensations, emotional tones, feelings, and intuitive sensing, and can include imagery or words. It is a way of accessing information that is usually unconscious. Focusing is also a process of finding meaning and placement for material retrieved through a felt sense. And this is a bit long, but I'd like to read to you how she describes a felt sense because you know so much of our practice is just really on this it's so it's so local, right? These teachings are broad and encompassing. And then when we sit down and when we close our eyes, we feel hot <laughs> and we have a thought and we have an emotion and we have a pain in the knee. And it's right here that we learn to wake up in our, to the deepest truths of experience. So I, I just really love how she describes what it's like to have a felt sense, something that's kind of indescript in ways. You might relate to this. As the session begins, applying sustained awareness to physical sensations as an access point, I tracked the felt sense. In doing so, layers of material became conscious. The sensation of fear was linked to a lack of self-esteem. An inter internal narrative of sabotaging inner voices became conscious. Who do you think you are? You shouldn't take central place. You can't do it. You're not worth it. The corresponding energetic movement was to curl up and disappear. I felt shame. I was too demanding. Being demanding was often a criticism leveled at women or at nuns when concerns were raised about the impact of gender inequity in the monastery. As I continued to track the feeling tones, there was anxiety that I would be judged for not conforming to some internalized belief of how I should be. I need to be small in order to belong so that I can be accepted and safe. Suddenly this feeling felt ancient. I became aware that the shadow side of conforming was a less pretty me that was resentful and uncooperative. As I tracked the process guided by the person leading the inquiry, I plunged into a feeling of loss of power at the core of which was the life statement, I have no right to be here. And this is Tanisra's genius. As the session continued, the felt sense of another inherited layer came into focus. Historically, in Britain, working class people did not move beyond their station in life. Statements like, who does she think she is, kept you firmly in place. This put down inevitably becomes internalized. My father and his family had moved from Dublin to England around the time of the Second World War. Being Irish in England was difficult. In spite of most of the family leaving their home city of Dublin, my grandfather, whom I never met, stayed behind in Ireland. Immigration brings dislocation and sometimes shame. It's quite common for immigrants to maintain silence about their conditions and circumstances that led to their decision to relocate to another country. This is a complex legacy for the children of immigrants. 
as it leaves a vacuum of shadowy territories, stories and connections with relatives that are lost, language and accents that are changed, customs and geographical areas that are severed, and family secrets that are hidden. All of this just by noticing the body, right? On the English side, my mother and her parents went through two brutal wars, including the London Blitz, where they spent hours in their shack of a shelter in the garden while bombs fell around them. The First World War of 1914 was a legitimate slaughter of millions across European battlefields in the name of colonial Goliaths gone mad. A war my English grandfather couldn't speak of without tears coming to his eyes. In the female line of both British and Irish families, many have stories of distant aunts being put in mental institutions or taking their lives or undergoing botched abortions. These are lives that recede into invisibility, those devastated, falling to the wayside and poor and unforgiving global, social and religious systems shaped by a colonial imperative. In this session, I touched an old place where compliance and invisibility meant survival. As the inquiry continued, the feeling of pressure around my head became more pronounced. It was as if a tight cat pushed down my life force. I had never seen that sensation as an object of attention because it was so woven into the sense of me. I glimpsed the fear of being outspoken from a collective female inheritance. The sensation of being capped was a much more subtle version of foot binding in China. That was a way of controlling the movement of women. Through internalized oppression felt as a lack of worth is invisible, though internalized oppression felt as a sense as a lack of worth is invisible from the outside, it can be just as crippling. As I tracked the process, I saw the belief through irrational, though ir irrational, that taking central place was life threatening. The fear was there to keep me safe and in line. However, it had the effect of generating a subtle sense of depression, which I had often felt in my life. I mean, just the, the way she weaved through the deep dharma of the birth of a sense of self in moments with the psychological pattern and the ability to connect through mindfulness of the body to the history of her family, right? the history, actually our history. As this country was colonized by Europeans, you know, we, are, we are swimming in this history as well. She says, I like to think that our wounds, just like the classical five hindrances, are not shameful things, but catalysts for personal and collective transformation, social justice movements, literary and artistic expression, and a more compassionate world. The wounding of the soul is something we all inherit. And yet with the power of wise reflection and loving awareness, we can extricate our life force from redundant and dysfunctional beliefs. With the right conditions in place, shifts of awareness and release of old wounds can be quick. However, the work of integration requires patience. When I think of the kind of patience needed on this path of awakening, I think of the maturity of Mr. Mandela. I remember seeing the small prison cell in which he lived for much of his 27 years of wrongful imprisonment. It defies comprehension how such a large man on so many levels withstood this tiny space for so long. Mr. Mandela's ability to transform such a bitter experience into compassion enabled a whole country to make a relatively bloodless transition of political power. I also think of the 21 years of Mahatma Gandhi's preparation in South Africa, where he learned his art of nonviolent resistance which essentially brought down the British empire in India. I think of numerous unsung heroes who suffer, serve, who offer service to the poor, sick and marginalized, 
sometimes in the face of the most appalling circumstances. I think of each of us and have faith that the power of our presence, which connects us to the deepest intelligence of the Dhamma, can transform the challenges of our times. An integrated awakening. Thanks for your kind and patient attention tonight, friends. We have a few minutes if anybody wants to add your voice to the space. I'd love to hear from you. Glad you brought up compassion because in chapter 12, which is seems like Tanisara started this conversation, she actually starts with a, um, a little teaching about metta and how the only way to do this work is with metta. Yeah, loving kindness, compassion. I'll just pass it over to Patrice then and invite the dedication of merit to close out our time together tonight. So if there is any goodness to our practice, any benefit or blessing or merit, we would, if we could, gladly, happily, joyfully share it. In fact, if we could, we would give it all away, every bit of it. We would give it to our parents, our teachers, our families, our friends, our community. We would give it to the people we like, the people we don't like, the people we know, and the many, many, many people we don't yet know. And in addition to the two-legged, we would give these blessings to the four-legged, the many-legged, the winged, the slithery, the scaly, the finny. We would give it to all of these. May all beings everywhere find a path of peace. May all beings be free from suffering. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Patrice. Yeah.